Um, okay, um, thank you. Let me just say um, I'm uh, happy to be here and uh, give this um, talk today. Um, so first, let me just um, acknowledge my collaborators, which are um, listed down here. Uh, so as uh, the title of this talk uh, obviously uh, indicates, I'm going to talk about kinetic turbulence in uh, astrophysical plasmas, and in particular about uh, waves uh, and structures that we can find in this type of turbulence and how they might be related to each other, or maybe not. Um, so I'm going to start with waves. Um, and in particular, in this talk, I'm going to focus on uh, solar wind turbulence. Uh, why? Because uh, for the solar wind, we have by far the best measurements uh, available. And uh, two great examples are shown uh, in these two plots. Uh, so we can send uh, spacecraft out there, and we can uh, probe the plasma dynamics there uh, in situ. So uh, the, the wind flies past the spacecraft at uh, speeds uh, ranging from about 400 to 800 kilometers per second. And then we can measure the, the time trace of, uh, let's say, of the let's say magnetic fields of some other quantity as the wind flows by, and by invoking the Taylor hypothesis, which was mentioned in the previous talk, uh, we can convert the frequency in the spacecraft uh, frame uh, into uh, an effective uh, wavelength in the plasma frame. Uh, so some historic background. First, um, so here uh, on the left is a picture from a paper by uh, Belcher and Davis from the 1970s. Um, showing a direct detection of Alvin waves in the solar wind. So these are Alvin waves, for those of you who maybe don't know, these are probably like the most simple and most famous type of uh, wave that you can have in a magnetized plasma. So they're supported by a mean magnetic field. Uh, and the waves travel up or down the mean magnetic field. As they travel up or down, uh, the displacements are uh, in the transverse direction. So you have uh, fluid velocity and magnetic uh, field perturbations. Uh, and uh, these perturbations are either in phase or out of phase uh, with each other, depending on the direction of propagation. And here on this plot, uh, they plotted uh, all the magnetic field components together with the velocity components, and we can see that they fit on top of each other, so they satisfy this relation. Um, but there's also turbulence in the solar wind, and here is a much more uh, recent paper um, showing this uh, turbulence <coughs> measured in situ with the space shuttle. And you can see we have many, uh, over uh, many decades uh, in scale, uh, we have a um, power spectra. But the solar wind, it's turbulent, but it's also very weakly collisional. So we have, um, here in this range, we have a, a fluid type of turbulence where the plasma behaves as a single conducting fluid. This is the so-called MHD inertial range with the Kolmogorov type magnetic spectrum. However, because it's so weakly collisional at the near-Earth solar wind, the, the, the collisional mean free path is almost equal to the distance from Sun to Earth. Uh, so the fluctuations can actually uh, cascade all the way down to the plasma kinetic scales. By kinetic scales, I mean scales comparable or smaller to the uh, thermal iron gyro radius. So the radius of the gyration of uh, the ions uh, perpendicular to the magnetic field. Uh, and there the turbulence changes because uh, the ions decouple from the electrons. Uh, and it's not just that. Uh, the turbulence becomes essentially kinetic in nature because um, so uh, there's also the, the turbulent energy can be dissipated, but it's not dissipated by uh, collisions. It's dissipated by, uh, it's channeled into the uh, ion and electron internal energy via collisionless wave particle <laughs> interactions. And the fraction of energy that goes into the ions and electrons, so uh, the ions can, can take up a larger or smaller fraction of the energy than the, the electrons. And because collisions are so weak, there is no guarantee that, th that these two temperatures were equilibrated. So it's essentially uh, the problem of ion and electron heating is an, is an interesting plasma physics problem. Okay, So how do we combine these two aspects? Well, there's a, a very known um, um, conjecture which is appropriate for strong wave turbulence. So this is the case I'm going to consider in this talk uh, by Goldreich and, Sre and Sreter from 1995 for MHD, which, uh, sorry, uh, which says basically uh, that the, the, the wave crossing time uh, is 
in, up to order unity uh, in balance with the nonlinear added turnover time. And this is a statement that is made scale by scale. Um, and so this concept has been more recently also adopted in some kinetic scale models uh, of turbulence. And this is, as I mentioned, some interesting implications for the ion electron heating. So this is the range that I want to focus on in uh, this talk right here. Um, so this so much about waves. Um, now going to structures, quite generally in a variety of turbulent system, almost any turbulence doesn't have to be a turbulent wave system, we see structures forming. Uh, and here in particular, I, I give two examples of uh, structure formation in a turbulent wave system. So here on the left, we see some example from rotating turbulence, uh, for example. Uh, here in the middle is a, is a picture from one of my own kinetic simulations showing uh, electron density fluctuations. And here this line shows the magnetic uh, field lines. And here is an, uh, sorry, here's an example of, um, of the anstrophy in stratified uh, turbulence. So we have this uh, localized uh, intense uh, structures forming. So then when we go back thinking about uh, waves, maybe like we would think of some, when you think about waves, maybe we would think about some linearized set of equations uh, of a more general nonlinear description from which we obtain uh, the wave dynamics. So if we have this kind of uh, localized structures with some high amplitude is the linear wave dynamics uh, at all relevant for these intense structures. And this is actually the, the question I'd like to address in my talk. Also, another aspect is, um, well, naively, one might think the added turnover time is inversely proportional to the fluctuation amplitude. And I'm explaining to why this is naively. So the nonlinear time, maybe it will be accelerated when we have locally si some uh, intense high amplitude events. So how does this, does this go together with the wave dynamics? Can it keep up? And um, again, there's um, interesting implications for the, um, for the ion and electron heating here, because let's say if there would be some uh, wave properties preserved in the structures, maybe we could uh, apply some like linear wave damping mechanism to study the heating in the structures. But if the structures are fundamentally different, then all this breaks down and all of this is completely useless. Um, so a few things about the methods that uh, we use. So we combine uh, 3D fully kinetic plasma simulations with uh, spacecraft uh, data from spacecraft observations. Uh, so I use a, a 3D kinetic uh, plasma code, which is uh, called OSIRIS. So basically, we solve the charged particle dynamics, uh, ions and electrons, self-consistently coupled with the Maxwell equation. So the particles serve as sources for the Maxwell equations, and everything is done uh, self-consistent. These are uh, massively parallel uh, computer simulations. Um, but in addition to that, uh, I'm also going to be using uh, data from spacecraft, uh, in particular from uh, so-called cluster and uh, MMS mission. Uh, for, uh, from cluster, we use uh, data from the free-streaming solar wind, whereas from uh, MMS, it's actually from the Earth's magnetosheet, which is actually not that of a clean type of turbulence. Uh, however, MMS has much uh, better instruments on board, so you can measure certain things that you cannot measure with uh, cluster, for instance. And um, so here's an example, for instance. Uh, so here's the uh, uh, data from some simulation that I'm going to be using. This is, so this is a driven 3D kinetic simulation. Here's an approach uh, to steady state. Uh, and the spectrum, as you see, is not Kolmogorov, because as you've seen on, on the introductory slide uh, showing also data from uh, solar wind measurements, uh, in the kinetic range, the spectrum is much uh, steeper because it's a different type of turbulence. And down here, I, uh, I compare the scale-dependent flatness of different components of the magnetic field and of the electron density in the simulation and also from the data from the uh, spacecraft. And we can see that there's some uh, intermittency here. So we have values above uh, the, the three, which will be expected for a normal distribution. So this is the data that we use. So now, coming back to my uh, original question, um, I mean, maybe the question is kind of uh, clear as, uh, on its own. But when you start thinking, like, could, 
could we construct some kind of diagnostics to actually uh, measure this, things become maybe a bit less obvious and for the following reasons. So in, if we consider strong wave turbulence, um, the wave frequency, this is just a, a rewritten version of the critical balance statement, uh, is comparable to the inverse lifetime of an eddy. And because this is the lifetime of the eddy, this also determines the, the uncertainty for the, the measurement. So basically, um, sorry. So basically, the, the uncertainty is of the order of uh, the frequency, the uncertainty is the order of the frequency itself. So basically, there's no hope that we can measure any dispersion relation. Uh, so what is done uh, instead um, in uh, simulation and also in spacecraft observations is you can com compute the power spectra of different quantities, for instance, different components of the B field or of the density field, and you can take ratios of these spectra. And from these ratios, uh, uh, when you, once you have these ratios, you can uh, take the linear predictions and you can directly compare the linear wave predictions with the measured ratios. So in, in this sense, you can probe if there's some signature of linear wave dynamics. Uh, however, this is also not quite what we'd like to do here because we'd like to, to probe the rare extremal events. And once you do a, a Fourier spectrum, you lose any information of intermittency. So what we came up with is uh, uh, the concept of so-called uh, generalized field ratios, which are similar to the original ratios, except we use, um, they're based on uh, wavelet transform coefficients. So you can, with the wavelet transform, basically you can, uh, they're sort of like bandpass filters in a very simplified way. So you can localize a signal simultaneously in real space and spectral space. So in that sense, you retain information about scale and variation in space. Uh, so in this sense, you can also, you can make these ratios um, sensitive to this kind of um, rare events. So this is uh, what we did. Um, and here are some of the results we obtained. So there's quite a few uh, figures shown on this uh, plot here. But let me just focus uh, maybe on this uh, middle row right here. So in this middle row, we consider the the ratio of the electron density to the perpendicular magnetic field. Uh, and we construct two types of ratios. Uh, so for the first type, basically we, we, we have the scale filter fluctuations and we compute different order moments of these fluctuations, the first, the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. So as we go to higher order moments, these ratios become progressively more sensitive to the more high intensity extreme events. And here on the right, uh, you can also, what we well, can also do with uh, wavelets, you can, if you have complex valid wavelets, you can compute sort of like a local power spectrum, uh, point by point. And then you can take conditional averages of those spectra over regions where the spectral density is above some threshold C in some normalized units. Uh, so here we vary the threshold C on the right, and on the top we um, vary the order of the moments. Uh, and uh, so the red lines are the linear wave predictions for uh, kinetic Alvin waves. Uh, I think I, yeah, the pointer does not work. Anyway, so here's the linear predictions for kinetic Alvin waves are the red lines. And the kinetic range that we're mostly interested in is in between those vertical dotted lines uh, in the picture. So the first vertical dotted lines uh, is uh, the ion kinetic scale, and the, the ones on the right are the electron kinetic scales. So we're interested in this range of scales. And in this range of scales, we actually find that even if we kind of try to give uh, a higher weight to these more uh, extreme and rare events, actually the, the values of the measurements don't change that much. So actually within order unity, even those rare and intense events um, are in reasonable agreement with the linear wave predictions. Um, so the structures themselves actually carry a wave character. Um, so, okay, so this is fine, but why would this happen? So, well, so one argument is just the one I mentioned in the beginning, it's just critical balance. So these time scales must somehow uh, balance, maybe perhaps even structure by structure, but it's maybe kind of a generic argument. So I, I try to think of if there's something maybe more specific that we can say uh, about this uh, in addition to the critical balance argument. And uh, well, there is, so there is one thing that, we can say, uh, let's look at some equations. Uh, so as I mentioned, the, the turbulence in the kinetic range is 
as the name says, it's inherently kinetic. So if you want to describe heating, you need a, a kinetic model. But aspects of it actually can be even described sometimes with reduced fluid models. And here's one uh, example here on top of some, of some kind of fluid model that's appropriate for this range. So psi is the so-called magnetic flux function. And uh, then we have the electron density. And this is how the equations look like. So the nonlinear terms uh, on the right are basically cross products between two perpendicular gradients. Uh, so perpendicular, I mean perpendicular to the mean uh, magnetic field. And what's maybe interesting to observe is that, uh, let's say consider the case then that uh, both of these fields, the, the electron density and psi, just depend on, on the, the parallel coordinate and just on the radial coordinates. Because they all depend just in the perpendicular direction on, on the, the radial component, all the gradients will be in the radial component, so this, these terms will cancel geometrically. Another case, if there's just dependence on, on one of the perpendicular coordinates, let's say x, all the gradients will be aligned and the nonlinearities will cancel geometrically. So these are, so then you're left with like a, a wave system. Um, and interestingly, uh, actually simulations and observations find uh, structures that are uh, actually either resemble like elongated sheets or circular tubes. So here's an example from a simulation on the right. So the idealized versions of these uh, structures would be actually exact wave solutions because the nonlinearities cancel geometrically. Uh, of course, in a turbulent system, you can never realize such ideal structures. So probably, you know, there's going to be some misalignment. But still, you know, uh, on average, there's probably some cancellation of weakening of nonlinearity. And by the way, Equations similar to this type can be also obtained uh, for other systems in the strongly anisotropic limit, in particular for rotating turbulence uh, or for uh, just MHD turbulence. Uh, so while these are very simple equations, uh, can we actually find any evidence of this sort of uh, thing in our data? Uh, so I went back to our data and I considered just the, the, the nonlinear term on, in the first equation. So this term can actually be rewritten as a cross product of the perpendicular electron fluid velocity and perpendicular magnetic field. Uh, so we compute this term. And then similar to the sum of the previous plots, we take conditional averages of this term over regions where the spectral energy density is high. Uh, OK? So we, we consider this uh, threshold C, and then we increase the threshold. And when we do this, we actually see that this uh, that this uh, alignment becomes stronger for more intense uh, structures. Uh, so indeed, actually, in structures, there, must, there is some dynamic insulation of this uh, nonlinearity. And this is actually similar to what was found, for instance, in uh, MHD turbulence. Um, so this brings me to my conclusion. So um, we argue that actually the kinetic scale structures themselves deserve a, a wave uh, signature. And this is maybe somewhat uh, opposite to uh, one of the present common views in literature, which kind of talks about waves and structures coexistence, so they are kind of mutually exclusive things. Uh, and one of the arguments why this might be so is that actually, well, naively speaking, you would think the nonlinear time is accelerated just inversely proportional to the fluctuation amplitude. But actually, there's this geometric factor that you have to consider. Uh, so actually, the structures are not that much more nonlinear, I guess, than maybe anything else that's uh, out there in the turbulence. So, thank you. So we have just about two minutes for questions. So I think I should stop. What does the uh, kinetic energy spectrum look like when you have this structure? Um, Is it very sharp? You mean like magnetic energy? Mm -hmm. or, uh, well, the spectrum is, um, that's the thing. Like when you look at those spectra, like you cannot tell like this is a spectrum with structures or this is a spectrum without, you know, there's no, there's they no. the same. Yeah, there's no, there's, that, that's the, the thing. So like you look at the spectra, so you say, okay, this is like a wave turbulence spectrum. So where are the structures? Where are they, you know? I so. Yeah, but in principle, maybe, you know, if they would have some kind of different dynamics of their own, maybe they would also, and if they would carry a significant fraction of energy, which a lot of times, if the turbulence is very intermittent, they do, 
maybe they would uh, modify the, the spectrum in, a, in a total, but it's not quite what it, Of course, well, there's in general, like there can be correct intermittent corrections to the turbulent spectrum. And there's actually one very hot topic in kinetic range uh, turbulence, but- uh, is, the, is the kurtosis very high? What, what's the kurtosis? So this is the kurtosis right down here. So it reaches values of about six at the smaller scales, but in the solar wind, it's much higher. For, for instance, here in the bottom, it's about 10, but it's actually one puzzling thing is that it's constant. Ah, so it's, okay. it's, 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 the statistics are not normal, but actually not, not that high. Scale, scale dependent. Okay. Yeah. Well, I actually have a three question too. So this is interesting that you said there's essentially an exact installation that enables the nonlinearities to basically vanish, and that's why you can get these kinetic structures themselves having a wave-like nature. But um, do you think this would persist in a real diastrophysical plasma? Because you know this exact cancellation is because the equations that we write down have certain you know geometric properties, which are probably partly because they're idealized equations. And I'm just kind of thinking in a realistic astrophysical plasma, you might have essentially vortices of noise that display the exact cancellation. Well, I mean, we also compare against measurements of solar wind. So this is one real plasma where we have the best measurements. But uh, and do you see I, the persistence of these? Well, I mean, we get reasonable agreement with this, with this predictions that we kind of uh, with these simple models. Of course, the agreement is not uh, perfect. But I mean, this is actually a good point. It's by no means obvious that with some a simplified model uh, with so many approximations, which are physically motivated, but still there's a large set of approximations. It's not obvious that you would come anywhere close to what happens in a real plasma. Just when we do this fully kinetic 3D simulations in all of their glory, and we, we, we check the spacecraft data, we find actually that, surprisingly, there are some aspects that you can study with this kind of simplified model. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would make sense if this geometric cancellation is due to some cancellation that the real thing is also happening. That's actually, that's also true. Like, in, in, in some kinetic equations, actually, like, in some reduced kinetic models, like one model that's often used in this context, like a gyrokinetic model, it's basically like the, the non-linearity is like a Poisson bracket, which this linearity is what I showed actually are. So actually, you can have the same kind of cancellation there. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, Daniel. And uh, let's take it. Um, yeah, so my name is Rohit, and uh, I'm a graduate student at MIT. Uh, my advisor is uh, Professor Jan Dunkel. And today, I'm going to talk about, as the name suggests, uh, linearly forced flow on a rotating sphere. Maybe I'll stand here. Um, so first of all, thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful uh, conference, and thanks for uh, staying back. I hope that you won't regret this decision after the talk is over. So that's that's my motivation today. Uh, so I'm going to talk about mostly these systems. Uh, you know, we have seen videos of uh, beautiful Milky Way galaxy simulations. Uh, so this is the best I have. So I'm just rotating my camera a little bit to make it a bit more fancy. Uh, but essentially, Jan has already set the stage some time ago about uh, the model that I'm going to uh, talk about. And the broad motivation is really uh, lies with the theme of the conference, which is universality, turbulence across vast scales. Um, so you have these different systems, which are active systems, and on, on, on people are interested in the dynamics on a sphere. And uh, I'm certainly not claiming anything here, but uh, if you just take a step back, uh, I, I find it quite inspirational that you can connect these ideas uh, in different uh, uh, systems. So I'm going to talk about the generalized Navier-Stokes equations, which Jan uh, mentioned a while ago. Um, so these are uh, this is a minimal model uh, that uh, basically talks about an incompressible velocity field, uh, and you have a Navier-Stokes-like momentum equation with some higher order terms uh, that are here. And so these gammas are essentially phenomenological parameters that you put into the system to create an internal forcing through a linear instability. So that's essentially the basic idea. So if you look at the dispersion relation of the system, and you flip the sign of gamma 2, so if gamma 2 is less than 0, then you get a dispersion relation that looks like this. And here, what happens is you introduce a band of unstable, a linearly unstable uh, modes. So you are internally forcing the system so that these modes grow, and these modes which are outside this band basically dissipate. And so what happens is uh, you end up getting these vertical patterns uh, in your flow field, which have a certain dominant length scale, which corresponds to the most unstable uh, wave number. So that is 1 over lambda, which is lambda is the uh, size of your vortices. And uh, there is a time scale, which corresponds to the maximum growth rate of that particular mode. 
Uh, there's a third parameter, which is this kappa, which is essentially the bandwidth uh, at which uh, you are forcing. So if this kappa is really large, then that would correspond to um, sort of forcing uh, at all modes, and it, it's almost equal to uh, random forcing. And so uh, in um, the two-dimensional Fourier space, uh, what it looks like is, uh, is like a racetrack here. So this gray region is where you are sort of pumping in energy, and then the advective nonlinearity carries that energy outside, and the modes get uh, dissipated. So um, there have been uh, studies of GNS on a non-rotating sphere where incompressible 2D flow on a sphere was considered using uh, with internal forcing. And uh, I'm going to talk about theta being the co-latitude and not the latitude. Um, and phi is the longitude. And so in the previous paper, uh, Jonas Schlomka basically derived uh, the GNS dynamics on a sphere. And he expressed the equations in terms of vorticity omega and stream function psi. And this is just like uh, Navier-Stokes. Uh, on the left side and on the right side, you have this f that provides an internal driving. So that's really just the key difference uh, that we are adding into this uh, system. And this f is essentially this polynomial with these phenomenological parameters, which are uh, the gammas. Okay. So now what I want to do is uh, take this model and start uh, to consider it as a minimal model by uh, considering rotation. So we want to investigate the interactions of internal driving and rotation. And when you want to do that, you consider the absolute vorticity. Uh, you decompose it into a relative vorticity, which is the vorticity in the rotating frame, and the Coriolis parameter, which is 2 omega uh, cos theta. Um, and if you do that, uh, you end up uh, extending these equations with this extra term over here, which, is, uh, which has this phi derivative of the stream function. And that's essentially the only difference in the GNS equations in the non-rotating case uh, with the rotating case. And we want to see what happens when we consider this, um, this effect. Right? So, so our equations are these. Again, I want to remind you of this dispersion relation. And uh, essentially, we have five parameters. So we have these gammas, we have the rotation, we have the, uh, we have the uh, radius of the sphere. And uh, what is actually important is these three-dimensional parameters, which I'm going to be using in this talk. Right? So what is important is, firstly, this ratio of r and lambda. So this is how large is my sphere as compared to the size of the vortices that I'm forcing in the, uh, in the GNS model. Then there's the, uh, the dimensionless bandwidth, which is kappa lambda. And then we have a uh, rotation rate, which is uh, as compared to the uh, typical life of these vortices that is, again, forced by the GNS uh, dynamics. And so we argue that these are the three dimensionless parameters that play a role. And uh, we will fix kappa lambda to uh, 1 in this talk. So this time, uh, let's remind ourselves uh, quickly about spherical harmonics. Um, so spherical harmonics are basically eigenfunctions of uh, the Laplace's equation on a sphere. And these are these YLMs, where L uh, represents the wave number in the uh, meridional direction. And phi is basically the wave number in the azimuthal direction. And quickly want to say that you know, when M is 0, then essentially there's no azimuthal variation. And you have these different uh, L modes that you see on the on the sphere. Right. So what's interesting, we think, is that this model has stationary exact solutions. And uh, to see how we can construct it, uh, we can again go back to the dispersion relation. And now I'm plotting it in terms of the spherical uh, wave number L. And again, there we have this uh, unstable bandwidth. And at the edges of this, we have this L minus and L plus, which basically make this operator on the right side 0. And it can be shown that they are also they, uh, they also satisfy the nonlinear operator on the left hand side, and so spherical harmonics with m equal to zero with uh, these l's which lie on the neutral modes of the original dispersion relation are essentially uh, stationary solutions of this uh, the system. So then we go forward and uh, do simulations of the model using Daedalus. So this is I think uh, uh, a few talks I mentioned uh, using uh, Daedalus. And so Keaton Burns, who was originally at, MIT, uh, at Flatiron and now is at MIT, uh, helped me set up this code. So let's talk about the simulation. So here, uh, I'm showing you a simulation when uh, omega is uh, 0, so we are not rotating. And as we see this uh, simulation, we can see that there are these vortices that basically are forced. So there's a certain length scale that we can see, and that is forced by the GNS dynamics. And as Jan mentioned earlier, one can actually uh, show that these are 
the, the system is basically hopping between stationary solutions for this uh, system when omega is um, zero. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to rotate this system uh, at certain rotation rate omega, and then we'll see what uh, happens. So here, um, just visually, we can see that there are these zonal jets that uh, start to arise, and that's predominantly because of the uh, rotation. Uh, another thing that's interesting is that, as expected, the dynamics on the poles is different from the dynamics at other latitudes, equator, where the rotation effects are felt the most. Um, and you can see that these, these persistent vortices that sort of stay um, at, the, um, at the poles. So what we think is essentially interesting is these are these uh, zonal uh, jets that arise because of the uh, rotation. And so one can go ahead and uh, think about different r over lambdas uh, in, this, uh, in this case, and also different rotation rates. And we can see that as we vary this r over lambda, we can generate patterns of different sizes. And for all these cases, when omega is very large, you have these zonal jets that uh, arise. And what's interesting is they are close to these stationary solutions. So here, um, uh, these stationary solutions are basically plotted for the L's that we got from these parameters for the dispersion relation. And you can see that the stationary solutions basically capture the bulk characteristics of the solutions at the highest rotation rate. Yeah. Uh, right, so the zonal jets are basically, uh, so in the next slide, uh, I'll, I'll get to it in the next slide, yeah. I, what I basically mean is the uh, velocity is, the azimuthal velocity is alternating. That's what I mean by zonal jets. I mean, are they the orbital No, they are the bands, right. So, so you're yeah. plotting I'm plotting vorticity, but if you plot velo azimuthal velocity, it would look the same. Uh, so I think in the next slide, I have uh, the azimuthal velocity. Yeah, so if you find the azimuthal velocity and the meridional velocity, the azimuthal velocity is what dominates, and so. Exactly, yeah, that's right. And so, yeah, so, the, so uh, we think that the high rotation case is what is interesting, and um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll go to the next slide first. So here is where there's the vorticity, and then this is the azimuthal velocity, and they sort of sit between the bands, essentially. And so we can think about this uh, from a spectral point of view, uh, right? So here what I'm plotting is the decomposition of this field in terms of spherical harmonics, and the dots are different spherical harmonic modes, the sizes of the dots are the amplitudes, and the color is the phase. And what you can see is that when the system settles onto this statistically stationary state, uh, you see these few modes within the forcing bandwidth uh, that are active, and they correspond to m equal to zero, and that basically sets the length scale of these uh, zonal jets that we see. And so here again, uh, so this is the zonal velocity, and the zonal velocity is alternating, so that's what I mean by uh, zonal jets. Um, and if you look at the total energy, uh, you can see that the total energy basically starts to increase because we are pumping, and then at the end, it settles onto some statistically stationary state where the energy pumping and the energy dissipation balance each other. And what is interesting is that just these few modes, which are essentially active, uh, contribute to most of the uh, energy. And that's what we see at different parameters uh, as well. So you can project the dynamics to these basically few modes and, and, and uh, sort of maybe analytically explain what is uh, happening. Right, so the, the forcing is indeed internal. So there's no external forcing. So that's the uh, sort of the uh, internal forcing that we're talking about. So this F, here is what forces the system. Is it, is it continuous forcing, or do you put down something initially and then? Right, so initially we start with a random field. So initially you just start with a random field with a very small amplitude, and then uh, the modes that are in this bandwidth basically start to grow exponentially because there is a linear instability inbuilt in the system. And then those modes, when they grow, they interact through the advective nonlinearity. And um, is it, is, uh, 500 rotations about the, the longest length you have run the simulation? Uh, so, so I have run the simulations for uh, 50 time steps as compared to the activity uh, time scale that we set. So that 500 is actually the rotation rate. And I have, so the, the time scale that is important is this uh, tau, which is like the vortex uh, growth and decay scale. 
and we and we have run simulations up to 50 times that essentially okay you might want to try running it so um uh, you, you could probably do it uh, right easily, uh, running it like 2000 rotationally okay um, okay you might expect the, the jets to merge with each other you might expect what you, you would you might expect the, the jets to merge with each other um I don't think they will because uh, it's it's really we are setting the lens scale. So if you if you see this, um, um, right? So so it's it's really that there are these modes which will continuously be forced because the forcing bandwidth is right here. What might happen is because of the inverse cascade, the mode that is sitting right here might start becoming larger, but there'll still be these modes that will be uh, forcing this. Yeah, here is the uh, inverse cascade is arrested at the you know uh, rotational scale, um, but that arrest mechanism isn't perfect. Right. So if you wait a long time, uh, you know you lose the you lose the arrest, and eventually it, uh, um, you get energy pile up at like four wave numbers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can talk about that. But I think I think I think you will keep seeing these modes because we have settled on a statistically stationary state. So I think that if you keep running these simulations, it will it'll stay there, I think. Yeah. yeah. Excuse me, does your right hand side, does it, does it involve negative viscosity? Yes, it does. So, so you have negative viscosity and, bi and biharmonic stabilizing viscosity? Uh, right, that's right. So, so you have kuramoto sivashinsky equation in a way? Uh, it's not exactly that. It's a bit different, I think. Uh, the, 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 the structure point, is similar, but uh, it's not exactly Kuramoto Shivasin. This is yeah. this is where, where your instability is coming from. But uh, right. our experience is that if your biharmonic friction is constant, the scheme is unstable. It needs to be a fl uh, flux dip. Uh, biharmonic I mean, gives you the, gives you the instability. Right. So and there's also a sixth order. Yeah. yeah so let me go back. Uh, yeah, so here, there's the biharmonic, which gives you the instability, but there's also a stabilizing, uh, like, del to the sixth that basically damps the large wave numbers. Right, but if your negative uh, destabilizing term is not a function of the flow, then the scheme becomes unstable. You, you need to make it uh, fl flow dependent. Uh, it is flow dependent here. Okay. And if it's flow dependent, then you can extract epsilon. You can actually extract the forcing which goes into the system. I, I, I'll show you after. OK, yeah. Yeah, so by, yeah, let me just clarify. By flow dependent, what I mean is that this is basically acting on the velocity field itself. Uh, that's what I mean by flow dependent. But, we can, but it, we can talk about it later. Is it constant or it's some function? Uh, oh, it is constant, yes. The, the parameters are constant, yeah. I guess you're mentioning that the parameter should be a function. Parameter should be. Okay, we, maybe we can talk about it later. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. So I have run out of time, but maybe if I can get two minutes into the question time, I can talk quickly about these Rossby waves that we see, uh, because I think that's also a very interesting thing. Um, so yeah. So uh, so so the westward propagating waves are really Rossby waves that we see, and uh, that's what you should expect. Uh, I had a little demonstration for uh, the. Uh, for those who are not aware of Rossby waves, but I'll just sort of skip that and just say that we can essentially construct these exact solutions on the sphere as well as on the tangent plane, which is called the, uh, the, the beta plane in geophysical fluid dynamics. And um, again, the idea is similar, which is that you can basically take think about these uh, L modes, this L plus and L minus on the sphere, and this K plus and K minus on a tangent plane, because then you can deal with Fourier modes. Um, and uh, have them to be the roots of your uh, polynomial dispersion relation, and then also have these uh, azimuthal modes, which are Rossby waves, so that they have a particular phase speed of these uh, Rossby waves. And so since we have this prediction um, of Rossby waves, we can just go back in the simulations and try and measure it. So here, what I'm plotting is the deviation of the vorticity from the mean vorticity at different latitudes. And you can see these waves that are going westwards, which are essentially... Uh, Rossby waves, but we can see we can basically try and measure this phase speed and see if there's an, an it matches with the analytical prediction. And so here, what I'm showing you is the Fourier spectra at every latitude, and you can see that there are these power spectra um, um, as a function of latitude, and they sort of tilt. And if we can go back to our dispersion relation, 
uh, for the Rossby waves and essentially take into account the fact that we are forcing modes in this racetrack with a minimum k minus and a maximum k plus. What I'm plotting is these white lines with, for k minus and k plus. We can see that we can capture pretty much the spread of the power spectra for these Rossby waves. So we think that this, this, this model has some usefulness in terms of you know, the analytical predict, uh, you know, prediction capability that one might uh, have. So just to conclude, uh, we have a minimal model for pattern formation on rotating sphere, and uh, we can construct exact time-dependent solutions for zonal jets and Rossby waves, and these exact solutions can be seen in uh, nonlinear simulations. Thank you. So we have just about two minutes for questions, and I'm sure we can use those well, and then any further questions can be addressed during the discussion section with colleagues. Yeah. So these exact solutions you mentioned, are they nonlinear or are they somehow neutral? I'm not quite clear about that. Um, so, so they are. Does, does the nonlinear term vanish identically? Or? The nonlinear term vanishes identically. And then the linear term vanishes. So the, yes. So, so they it's are not the a balance between the linear and nonlinear. It's just. Uh, no, it's not. So it's. Yeah, right. So it's. So it's not like a soliton kind of a solution. It's that the, the nonlinear term vanishes exactly, and the linear term also vanishes exactly. And in fact, these solutions are also not stable because of the internal forcing that you have. But we still think they are useful because they give you some idea about the instantaneous nonlinear solutions that you see in the systems. Yeah. So following up on that interesting yeah. question, are you saying that at the level of the differential equation, the nonlinear terms vanish exactly? So is it actually a linear differential equation? And if so, could you then imagine putting an external force in and constructing a solution to that force system with variation parameters? Like, uh, like get if you had a little, you know, say, external body like a moon of a planet kind of perturbing the planet. Right. So, uh, well, so the equations are indeed nonlinear. It's just that I think the question was, uh, so these exact solutions that we have, uh, are they somehow, if you put in the nonlinear term has some contribution and the, the linear term has some contribution and they both cancel each other. But I think that's not the case. It's just that for these solutions, the nonlinear term is exactly zero and the linear term is also exactly zero. But the simulations that we have run, they are nonlinear. So I don't think we can really linearize if, so if I got your question correctly. Equation. Yes, it is. It has the nonlinearity of Navier-Stokes, and it just has a linear forcing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then, so what sets the amplitude of these solutions? Do you have any amplitude you can have? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you can have any amplitude uh, you want. Yes. Um, uh, so what we observe in the simulations. Uh, I haven't really looked at what sets the, like, you start at almost zero energy and you start pumping and the energy grows and then it settles onto a stationary state, right? Um, I don't have intuition as to what sets that final energy length scale, uh, but the exact solutions can have any amplitude. Uh, it's it just the structure of those equations that we are sort of appealing to. Uh, but yeah, that's a good point. I, I should think more about what sets the final energy in the stationary state. The vanishing of the linear of the nonlinear terms is independent of the amplitude, right? It's just something is yes. orthogonal to something else. That's yes, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that so that's why we don't have amplitudes for the exact solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask one quick question? Yeah. So you have so you have two light scales, right? So you have the radio scale and then you have the transform scale. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's possible if I make this uh, lambda to be very similar to the radius of the sphere. And so I think Jan showed a movie of uh, the solutions jumping. Yeah. And so it would be interesting to do that jumping case with rotation. And maybe something like that would, I haven't done that yet, but maybe I'll do that and send you an email. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay?
Yeah, so um, I've listed some questions that came up during the session, which seems to be coming up actually repeatedly all throughout the workshop. Uh, they, uh, these are just a few ones. Um, we can talk about this, um, but we can also, if you have more questions uh, from the session, uh, we, can do, we can start off with that. So it's your choice. Because it's like um, giving a lecture, nobody wants to talk. <laughs> Did we? Okay. Um, okay. Um, wh what about the? Um, no, I, I don't have any preconceptions or pre uh, um, any um, pre notions. Um, why don't we start with the first one? And if you feel like we discussed the second one, uh, we can jump to the third one. So the first one's um, uh, this this problem that that Ethan um, mentioned several times, uh, but perhaps not wanting to mention it directly. This is um, critical challenge uh, for numerical models, and I I think I I sum it up basically as the problem of properly resolving the flow. Um, this is, you know, this is has been a critical problem ever since uh, we started solving Navier-Stokes um, numerically. So, um, question that I want to pose to the audience: that the two people that are left, um, <laughs> can, can anything be done about this problem? Oh, see, we gotta. We gotta I mean, I <laughs> take can anything it. be done? I mean, I don't know quantum computers, but <laughs> like in in lieu of that, actually, one thing I haven't seen too much, although I'm sure it's in the papers, um, is resolution studies, and they're extremely important. <laughs> so, like for example, um, Shmuel Bialy, who presented on Tuesday but isn't in here, we're working on looking at some different types of turbulent statistics where we change the driving scale. And of course, the the boxes are already so small that if we try to push the driving scale a little lower, we have to do a lot of convergence tests to make sure whatever statistic we're looking at is you know properly converged. So, I think in terms of point number one, the main thing we all need to constantly be doing is to be doing convergence studies to make sure what we're looking at is is actually you know physical and not just numerical. That's right, and and, and I would and I would add to that that you need to do these um, convergence tests for every problem, uh, different problem you're doing. There's no univers uh, universality to the convergence. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to continue on the same point. Also, on uh, better algorithms is uh, something that we definitely need. In particular, in, in compressible turbulence, when we start modeling it uh, using supercomputers, wow. <laughs> we use second-order accurate schemes, right. which is not good for turbulence. So we really need to concentrate on um, development of uh, stable high-order methods for, for compressible flow. And so funding should go in that direction, I think, if you want to learn more about it. Uh, my experiments with this, so we, I was uh, showing some results from uh, seventh order accurate in space at low Mach numbers. Um, so uh, th there are very efficient algorithms. Um, the, the issue is their stability, mm -hmm. of course. But um, for example, if you use nonlinear filter scheme of uh, seventh order, it is 15 times cheaper than standard VIN of five uh, computationally. If you want to recover the uh, scale separation that you are, you need. So, <clears throat> I think definitely the future is uh, in that direction, but uh, I'm not sure there is enough effort in the community. Um, um, so CCM. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for compressible things, I'm assuming you mean for shocks, in particular. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. So uh, in the incompressible world, you, uh, 
we have a kind of spectral methods as standard, but unfortunately, when compressibility and shocks show up, um, the, uh, it's very hard to get the same quality of solution unless you go to high order uh, finite difference or finite volume methods. And uh, I think it's a, um, it's a necessary step because otherwise we are wasting cycles of our computers uh, for nothing. Well, yeah, same quality of crap crappiness, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. This note of um, the computational side, I was a little surprised no one mentioned GPUs because I think that's something that um, has really become more accessible in the last few years and more possible to code for. And my understanding is GPUs do very well when you have a high flop to byte ratio. So essentially when you're doing a lot of computations on a small amount of data or when you have a problem that parallelizes really well. And I just kind of wondered, have people in the community been thinking about algorithms for turbulence studies that are well suited to GPUs and um, or the impact GPUs can make on this? Do you, do you want to say something about it? Or? Okay. I know um, there's a group at uh, MSU. Um, there's a there's a group of people at MSU that are using GPU to look at turbulence, MHD turbulence. Um, there actually um, the this is his name is Philip, right? Great yeah, yeah. He actually developed or he sort of wrote a wrapper so that um, you can basically. Transform a Stina plus plus, yeah, to a, a GPU compatible code. Um, so just take a normal code and then it becomes GPU compatible. Yeah, yeah, yeah people are doing that. I mean, but th that's that's true in certain types of applications. You can get a big speed up out of GPUs, but it but it doesn't cure the 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 problem that lots of schemes are not well suited to the problems that they're purporting to solve, right? I mean, resolution, yeah. Um, do, do people have uh, feelings about uh, finite difference or finite volume versus spectral or some other algorithm? Right? Well, I have feelings, but in the non-numerical Can you please use your seat mic? I have passionate feelings, despite the fact that I'm not a numericist. That's fine. <laughs> um, spectral methods are wonderful in MHD because they give you um, sufficient accuracy and reach that you can do much more realistic computations. I think that's generically true in turbulence, where there's this enormous difficulty that we have in getting adequate resolution. But it's really hard to combine spectral codes with any kind of realistic background environment. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know what the solution is supposed to be. Th there, there are th uh, algorithms such as spectral element methods that's uh, sort of combining um, spectral algorithm locally, but uh, it's, on a, it's on a grid. Uh, um, you know, um, but I guess, you know, for most of us doing physics work, we don't generally tend to worry about uh, funny boundaries or funny funny shaped boundaries or, or so forth. But but these yeah. things arise spontaneously in some environments. Yeah. And even if it's not funny shaped, you know, if you're doing like an accretion disk, you have this problem that, or, or a star, you have this problem that there's a set background with a broad range of scales uh, against which you're trying to calculate convective turbulence or you know, magnetic field generation. Problem for the spectral methods is that just the usual that you know, if you have Fourier modes on a funny boundary, you just get basically it. Fourier yeah. modes on yeah. background. It's hard to find a basis I mean the, for. It. Yeah. The whole point with spectral methods is that you have spectral convergence, but that's only in the presence of smooth things. Right. And so if you have shocks and that kind of stuff, then all that is out the window and you devolve to a, you know, some sort of first or second order scheme just because your 4A modes are now decaying so slowly. Yeah. What about, I mean, the advantage of the spectral algorithm is the 4A modes are eigenfunctions, so you get algebra equations, but um, 
that's not just true of Fourier modes. You could imagine compactly supported analogs like wavelets having nice properties and using those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I personally also use um, a method called counter dynamics um, developed by um, counter dynamics. Yes. So <laughs> um, uh, originally developed uh, by Norman Zabuski, um ba based on actually nuclear bag model, right? Um, and for certain types of problem, um, namely 2D non-divergent or quasi 2D type problems where uh, the vorticity has an inversion, um, which allows you to uh, obtain the stream function from it, uh, it's fantastic. It's actually even, I, I think, much better than uh, spectral methods. But the problem is, uh, it, you know, it's, it's only really good for the situation where their um, uh, inversion is possible. It, um, if, uh, when it's not possible, it doesn't mean you can't use it, but it's, again, then it's um, the same as um, spectral or finite difference methods. Yeah, because that that's a conserved quantity. So um, uh, if if vorticity is conserved, uh, then uh, then it's invertible. Um, um, of course, its a, its strength is it in some ways its worst enemy because uh, it's an inherently an inviscid algorithm. So that uh, if you're trying to do very complex uh, flow, um, if you're trying to model a very complex flow. The complexity of the flow just overtake, you know, it, it, it exponentially increases, so you just quickly run out of uh, memory. Um, so the the way around that was to um, implement something called surgery. Um, there, there are uh, various different forms of surgery, but um, it, essentially, what you're trying to do is um, uh, if um, Vorticity contours are um, conserved um, for topological reasons. Uh, you can disconnect um, the vorticity lines if the um, scale, if it develops uh, kinks or small scales that perhaps uh, you know um, doesn't really do too much to the flow, uh, and you can uh, disconnect and smooth that uh, contour out and reconnect. Right. Um, so that that's one way of getting around it, and it, it, it's ad hoc, but the um, the power of doing that comes from the fact that you tend to uh, smooth along the contours ra rather than across, uh, which all, all the other algorithms do. So, it, uh, so if you have a jump, uh, for example, uh, like a shock like structure, uh, you you can retain that all the way, all the way throughout the the calculation without loss, essentially. Any other comments, feelings? Um, we, ha we have just one minute and a half. Um, do people like, they want to talk about the third item, or you want to, you're already ready for coffee? This this came from actually Boris's com uh, talking with Boris this afternoon. Yes. So speaking of the devil, um, was here. Yes, devil. Please speak. Uh, when you talk about Kalmogorov scaling, um, I was talking about anisotropic uh, scaling as well. So I was saying that in some flows you can have this steep spectrum which is not determined by Kalmogorov cascades, but in other direction it's still going like Kalmogorov. So the fluxes are still important. They are just not important in uh, general structure of the spectrum because it creates uh, structures in uh, along the direction when you have steep spectra. Okay, so you you cannot really say that Kolmogorov is becoming secondary when you have extra strains. It's just becoming much more complicated. And even the, the last talk which we had um, sec uh, simulations in the sphere. Um, if uh, um, Rahid computed spectrum 
in two dire in two directions, like uh, zonal and uh, and residual spectrum, non-zonal. He would have seen that uh, under strong rotation, zonal goes like beta square n to minus five, whatever beta it is. But in residual direction, it's still Kolmogorov spectrum. It goes like uh, minus five third. So uh, and, and the fluxes are <coughs> going by this. So I, I think we need to be careful when uh, when we deal with anisotropic spectrum. But you also mentioned that um, uh, for a broad range of um, uh, two-point correlation function, you, uh, it, it always uh, leads to a um, minus five-third type spectrum. Uh, it's v for some... So there's no physics in this, and, and yet... No, no, so it's there is a physics. I, actually, I told you Kolmogorov wrote another paper before this Kolmogorov 41. There was Kolmogorov 37 in German. <laughs> in which uh, he uh, goes into a random box theory and uh, uh, later on, just several years ago, uh, quite an old Russian academician who worked in this Kolmogorov, believe it or not, uh, Georgi Galit Georgi Galitsyn, he uh, says that uh, uh, the, Galitsyn, right? Galitsyn, yes, uh, the right. conditions set up by Kolmogorov so general that Galison says they describe most of the phenomena in the universe beyond fluid dynamics. So, uh, you know, if we explore this, we probably will find some interesting, uh, interesting things. So uh, don't be surprised that Kolmogorov spectrum works so well. Uh, you just need to have certain uh, correlation function for, uh, for the phenomena you consider, which is delta, delta decorrelated in time. All right? Um, so I think that it, it may explain at least partially why Kolmogorov spectrum is so uh, well observed. What, what, what delta decorrelated in time for those of us? Who uh, well, it's, it's, it has a structure delta t, t minus t prime. It's just it's. So it's basically you only have equal time correlations. It, is that right? Yeah, it's wide in time. It's yeah, yeah it's a wide wide noise. <laughs> Yeah. In time, yeah. Ethan, did you think did it? Comment that um, it's not all that good because when you have um, some dissipative channel available, as you do in uh, supersonic turbulence, right. or you know, if, if there's uh, resistivity larger than viscosity, you can get um, uh, a minus two power law, for example. Right. right. And I, I think generically one can say that putting Putting in some dissipative channel in the turbulence will bring you away from Kolmogorov. Uh, also, if, um, if the flow contains um, high amplitude or finite amplitude waves, for example, that also is a situation where it doesn't work so well. No, 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 for this, I'll tell you something else. You need to consider it's one dimensional spectrum on s or three dimensional because oftentimes we integrate over the, uh, over the wave number and then you smear the uh, peculiarities of the one dimensional spectrum. If you have one slope in one direction and one slope in another direction, when you integrate it, what slope do you get? Uh, in addition, you have intermittency effects. And in addition to this, you may have waves. And waves also add to the spectrum, and they also produce their own intermittency. Mm -hmm. It looks like intermittency, but it is not intermittency, it's waves. So it all needs to be carefully considered to, you know, to, to judge the slope of the spectrum. And what I'm telling you is that slope is not even as important as amplitude. The physics is not in the slope. The physics is in the amplitude. OK, I, I think we're actually, we went over time. So maybe this is a good stopping point. Uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the speakers uh, from this afternoon. And, and also the audience. Okay. <laughs>